Today we're looking at 1 Samuel chapter 10. And we're going to be continuing in this uh, development that God has allowed Israel to uh, embark upon where Israel has decided we want a king just like the other nations. We want to be like them. And God uh, explained to Samuel, Samuel, but Samuel's heart was very sad when they said that. And God told Samuel, Samuel, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me as, as their king. Speaking of God, they don't want God to be their king. They want to look like, act like, and, and be like all the other cultures around them. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, that's kind of something that is still going on. It's hard sometimes to stand out, to be different, to be unique, uh, especially when it comes to being different for the things of God. Um, being uh, uh, isolated is not fun. Being uh, looked at as weird is not, it's not comfortable. But sometimes God has, has called us to these unique situations. The scripture says he has uh, called us to be a peculiar people. And so, therefore, we are to not uh, always fit in with everything. Now, the Bible does say get along as much as you can get along with everybody. The Bible does say love your enemy. The Bible says pray for your enemy. The Bible says feed your enemy. So we, we, we should never remove love from anyone just because they think or act different than us. Um, <clears throat> and it's an important thing to keep in mind. But we're going to uh, take a look. Uh, at this particular situation as we are in the process of allowing Saul to become king. Uh, and this is not something that uh, God has approved upon, but we're going to see how he allows it to happen. And we're going to talk about something here that I think is important, and I'll point that out when we get to it. All right, so with that being said, let's get the reading in. 1 Samuel chapter 10. Let's take a listen here. Chapter 10. Then Samuel took a vial of oil and poured it upon his head, and kissed him, and said, Is it not because the Lord hath anointed thee to be captain over his inheritance? When thou art departed from me today, then thou shalt find two men by Rachel's sepulchre, in the border of Benjamin at Zelzah, and they will say unto thee, The asses which thou wentest to seek are found. And lo, thy father hath left the care of the asses, and sorroweth for you, saying, What shall I do for my son? Then shalt thou go on forward from thence, and thou shalt come to the plain of Tabor, and there shall meet thee three men going up to God to Bethel, one carrying three kids, and another carrying three loaves of bread, and another carrying a bottle of wine. And they will salute thee, and give thee two loaves of bread, which thou shalt receive of their hands. After thou shalt come to the hill of God, where is the garrison of the Philistines. And it shall come to pass, when thou art come thither to the city, that thou shalt meet a company of prophets coming down from the high place, with a psaltery, and a tabret, and a pipe, and a harp before them, and they shall prophesy. And the Spirit of the Lord will come upon me, and thou shalt prophesy with them, and shalt be turned into another man. And let it be, when these signs are come unto thee, that thou do as occasion serve thee, for God is with thee. And thou shalt go down before me to Gilgal, Behold, I will come down unto thee to offer burnt offerings and to sacrifice sacrifices of peace offerings. Seven days shalt thou tarry till I come to thee and shew thee what thou shalt do. And it was so that when he had turned his back to go from Samuel, God gave him another heart. And all those signs came to pass that day. When they came thither to the hill, behold, a company of prophets met him. And the Spirit of God came upon him and he prophesied among them. And it came to pass when all that knew him before time saw that, behold, he prophesied among the prophets. Then the people said one to another, What is this that is come unto the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? And one of the same place answered and said, But who is their father? Therefore it became a proverb, 
is Saul also among the prophets? And when he had made an end of prophesying, he came to the high place. And Saul's uncle said unto him and to his servant, Whither went ye? And he said, To seek the asses. And when we saw that they were nowhere, we came to Samuel. And Saul's uncle said, Tell me, I pray thee, what Samuel said unto you. And Saul said unto his uncle, He told us plainly that the asses were found, but of the matter of the kingdom, whereof Samuel spake, he told him not. And Samuel called the people together unto the Lord to Mispi, and said unto the children of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought up Israel out of Egypt, and delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians, and out of the hand of all kingdoms, and of them that oppressed you. And ye have this day rejected your God, who himself saved you out of all your adversities and your tribulations. And ye have said unto him, Nay, but set a king over us. Now therefore present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes and by your thousands. Once Samuel had caused all the tribes of Israel to come near, the tribe of Benjamin was taken. When he had caused the tribe of Benjamin to come near by their families, the family of Matri was taken, and Saul the son of Kish was taken. And when they sought him, he could not be found. Therefore they inquired of the Lord further, if the man should yet come thither. And the Lord answered, Behold, he hath hid himself among the snuff. And they ran and fetched him thence. And when he stood among the people, he was higher than any of the people from his shoulders and upward. And Samuel said to all the people, See ye him whom the Lord hath chosen, that there is none like him among all the people. And all the people shouted and said, God, God save, save the, king. the king! Then Samuel told the people the manner of the kingdom, and wrote it in a book, and laid it up before the Lord. And Samuel sent all the people away, every man to his house. And Saul also went home to Gibeah, and there went with him a band of men, whose hearts God had touched. But the children of Belial said, how shall this man save us? And they despised him and brought him no presents, but he held his peace. Chapter 10. All right. So <clears throat> here we go with this beginning of Saul becoming king. Now, it's being um, completely uh, explained that this is not something that God wants. And I cannot emphasize this enough on how a lot of times we can feel because God is opening doors to allow things to happen that we had petitioned him about. Um, that that does not mean that that's God's will. A lot of times he will allow things to happen and will give you opportunities to make a difference and a change. And we're gonna point that out here in a minute as well. Um, it, it's, you know, there's a reason why the scripture often says that God is a mysterious God. We, he's past our understanding. There's no way we can find him out. He does things that are so unique and so high above our ability to totally comprehend. And the, the problem that we have with people, as people is that we like to be able to control things. We like to be able to get things in a way that we can manipulate it and control it. It's in our nature to want to be. We want everything to work the way we want it to work. Um, and the problem is that we can't do that with God. We have to be a follower. And we can be all kinds of things. And a lot of times we try, we try to take God's word and throw it back at God. And say, Lord, all I'm doing is your word here. And God is like, no, you have manipulated it. <clears throat> excuse me. And have twisted it around to fit your own mindset and your own agenda. And people play with the word of God like that all the time. We point that out oftentimes how Satan did that as well. And we're going to see here that God does a lot of things for people whom he knows are not going to follow him. And yet at the same time God gives opportunity and gives uh, uh, access and gives blessings to people to follow him and God already knows they're not going to. All right? And we pointed that out. We talked about the prophet Balaam. We talked about the, uh, the uh, disciple Judas. And Saul falls into that same kind of situation. We could also about, talk about um, Korah, who came out of Egypt 
with Moses and how yet he, you know, he despised everything and eventually the ground opened up and swallowed up Korah. I don't know if you remember that. But uh, opportunity to come out, to start new, to do new, new things, and yet sometimes it just doesn't happen. And you say, well, well, how does, if God gives you the blessing, how does that not turn out to be a blessing for you? Because it came from God. And like I said, God's mysterious, and I can't specifically answer that question. But I'll give you an example. Let's say that you have uh, $10,000 in debt. Okay, so you got a debt of ten thousand dollars, and but yet the reason why you got debt is because you have no control over your you, you know you you don't you don't handle your money well. That's why you are in debt. Somebody comes to you and says, you know what, I'm going to pay your debt, and I'm not just going to give you your money for your debt, which is uh, uh, mercy. I'm not going to I'm not going to allow you to have to deal with that debt. I'm also going to give you an extra thousand dollars, which is grace, something that is up, uh, over and above your... So you get some mercy and some grace for your debt. So now you have a ten thousand dollar debt and somebody through grace and mercy has given you eleven thousand dollars. From that math, shouldn't you be out of debt? You should be. And you should have an extra thousand dollars. But it requires you to do what? Take the $10,000 and actually pay your debt down. The problem is a lot of times when people get that kind of a blessing that have the mindset that don't really know how to manage money, they don't pay the debt down. They may pay on it, but they will never pay it off. They want to go do other things. Well, I'm going to take this. I'm not going to get this $10,000 to my creditors. I'm going to go, I'm going to go on vacation or I'm going to buy a car. I'm, they think of all the other things they can do because they got this $11,000 and so they never pay the debt. Well, that's what happens a lot of times when it comes down to the things of God. God has paid our debt. What debt do we have? The sin debt. But we never take what God has given to us and apply it to our bill. We don't receive the gift of God. We take all the blessings and we do it for whatever we want to do it. And then, therefore, what happens? You're still in the same situation. That's why even though God died for the whole world, there is still people that have a sin debt because they're not taking the grace of God, the love of God, the mercy of God, the forgiveness of God, and applying it to their sin bill. They refuse to accept that I need to apply the righteousness of Christ to my life. Now, a lot of times people have all kinds of reasons for why they do that. And so they stay in debt, sin-wise. And this is what we're going to see. We'll point it out. This is what's going to happen to Saul. It looks like he's starting off well because he's got all these things that God is giving him, but he's not going to apply it to the problem. He, he's going to always come up with something else that he wants to do. And I'll point that out as we go through it. Let's get into the reading here. So chapter, chapter 10, verse 1, it says, Then Samuel took a vial of oil and poured it upon the head and kissed him. Now, he's pouring it upon the head of who? Saul. We saw that from the last chapter. Samuel and Saul have met. God has let Samuel know that Saul's going to be the king. And so Samuel anoints Saul. And that oil is representative of the, the Spirit of God being poured out upon Saul. And we're going to see that that's actually going to happen. But right now it's being done from a metaphorical standpoint and kissed him. The kissing it represents the approval, the love, the care. All right? It's a kiss on the, uh, uh, of, of, of embracing, of hello, of, of greeting. It's that kind of a, a kiss, a kiss of warmth and, and letting you know that you are welcome here. Okay? So he's got the anointing. He's got the welcome approval. All right? And said, is it not the Lord that have anointed thee to be captain over his inheritance. You're going to be the one that's going to rule over the gifts that God has given to his inheritance, which is the Israelites uh, people. So Samuel continues, and he says, When thou art departed from me today, then thou shalt find two men by Rachel's sepulcher. 
in the border of Benjamin at Zilzal. And they will say unto thee, the asses which thou wanted to see are found. And lo, thy father has left uh, the care of the asses and sorrow for you, saying, what shall I do for my son? So Samuel's letting them know. He's telling him ahead of time. This is an important thing to once again pause and talk about. What is Samuel doing? Samuel is prophesying. And what does that mean? That means that Samuel, from the wisdom and from the instruction of God, already knows what's going to happen. Why? Because God has told him. Now, keep this in mind. God has told Samuel this. But what God has not told Samuel is that Saul is going to be a massive failure. Right now, Samuel's anointing Saul with the, uh, uh, um, with the belief that He's going to be you know, the, the one that God's going to use to lead the people in their misguided uh, desire for a king. He will at least be the right one. We will see as we go further on that Samuel's going to be brokenhearted when he finds out the true nature of Saul. Now, now we're going to see here that there are certain other people here that are going to question this, but we'll get to that in just a minute. All right. So, uh, and then he also lets them know, all right, uh, you're going to go over by where Rachel's tomb is. You're going to see uh, some people. They're going to tell you that the, the, the donkeys have been found and that your father's now concerned about you. All of this before it happens. And what's beautiful about this is this is what the word of God is. The word of God has so much prophecy in it. It tells us about things before it happens. Uh, the Bible told us that... Um, Israel was going to become a nation before it happened. Israel was, was when we go through all of these uh, books in the Old Testament, we're going to end up with Israel no longer being a nation. And yet they're going to become a nation again uh, in what was it, 1947, 47, 48. They became a nation again. And then they recaptured Jerusalem in 1963. And people were like, well, why does the Bible talk so much about Israel when Israel is not even a nation anymore? And yet they became a nation, fulfilling the prophecies of God. There's so many prophecies that we could talk about, and that's, a, that's a, an act of God because he knows the difference between yesterday, today, and tomorrow. God can tell you what's going to happen because he knows all things. So the prophecy is being given to Saul by Samuel, and Samuel got that from God. Verse 3, Then thou shalt go forward from thence, and thou shalt come to the plain of Tabar. And there thou shalt meet thee three men going to God to uh, Bethel. One carrying three kids, or goats, the other carrying three loaves of bread, and another carrying a bottle of wine. So once again, he's giving uh, Saul, Samuel's giving Saul, very specific uh, prophetic items you will see and I'm telling you this before it happens that's why Samuel was called a seer or a prophet he saw things before it happened why? because that's what the spirit of God can do that no one else can do not even the devils or the angels none of them can do that only God can Okay, and that's one of the signature fingerprints of God prophecy all right, uh, and, and that's why you get a lot of what's called false prophets because everybody wants to say well I prophesied this so that must mean God's spirit is in me a lot of people try to claim that through all kinds of manipulation uh, but we'll deal with that a little later alright and so he says uh, in verse 4 uh, when you see this happen he says and when uh, they will salute thee and give thee two loaves of bread which thou shalt receive of their hand. So he's letting them know. When they offer you the bread, make sure you accept it. Take the gift. Okay? Verse 5. After that shall come uh, to the hill of God, where is the garrison of the Philistines, and it shall come to pass when thou art come thither to the city, that they sh thou shalt meet a company of prophets. So you're going to meet a 
pe- a, 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 a band of people that are um, noted and have been separated because of the gift of prophecy and they have joined together and they're a company, they're a band. And they, they are encouraging and instructing and working together and they're doing the work of God and God is beginning to set in order the office of prophet. Right? Samuel was one of the first ones uh, that had that continuous aspect. We do know that Moses did prophesy and has a prophetic ministry too, but Samuel was the first one to become that title of having being a prophet. And it continued now. It's starting to happen in other people. And so there's a company of prophets coming down from the high place with psalteries and tablets and pipes and harps uh, before them, and they shall prophesy. All right, so you're going to meet this company of prophets, and they are also musicians, all right, which I think is interesting because uh, it's, it's some kind of connection that God always has with how he anoints people and, and the song or the music. Um, and th- there's a connection there, and you say, well, Wayne, what's the connection? I don't know. <laughs> it's just one there. And you see that even David will be one that was a musician, and he played, and he had. Uh, but you got to be careful with that because the, what, one of the things that the Scripture says about the most uh, anointed angel that ever was, the anointed cherub, mm-hmm. was Satan. And Satan was the chief master of music. So, once again, your gifts and callings are without repentance. You don't have to repent to have those gifts. You do need to know God, and that's one of the things that we're going to see here about Saul. Saul is being called and gifted to become the king, but where is his repentance? That's what we want to see. Does Saul apply the gift of God to his sin debt? Or is he continue to run up the bill? Which one is he going to do? All right, look at verse 6, though. It says, And the Spirit of the Lord will come upon thee. The Spirit of the Lord is going to come upon who? Upon Saul. And I told you that when we read where Saul, where Samuel anointed Saul with the oil, which represents the Spirit of God come up upon him, this is where it will actually happen. It's, it's a metaphorical aspect with the oil being poured. This is the reality here in verse 6. The Spirit of the Lord is actually going to come upon Saul. It says, and the Spirit of the Lord will come upon thee, and thou shalt prophesy with them, and shalt be turned into another man. He's going to be transformed. He's going to be, he's going to be given the gifts of God. What are you going to do with the gifts that God has given you? And what is Saul going to do with this? Well, we're going to have to read a few more chapters. We're going to have to get deep into the book of 1 Samuel to be able to answer that question. But uh, I'll give you one uh, spoiler alert. It's not going to be pretty for Saul. Not at all. He's right now being anointed by the Spirit of God. Saul, at one point, is going to go search for another spirit, which is kind of sad, and we'll see that when we get to it. Verse 7. And let it be, when these signs are come upon thee, that thou shalt do as occasion serve thee, for God is with thee. Who's with Saul? God. And it's amazing how God can be with a lot of people. God has gifted a lot of people, has given a lot. And the people just, I'm not, I'm going to use God's gift, but I'm not going to serve God. And that's why they, they sound spiritual. They sound godly. They sound anointed. Because they are. And they start off. And they start off well. Mm-hmm. But they're not serving God. They're serving their own ambitions. And we have to be careful with that. And you got to make sure. And the problem also is that they 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 bring other people with them. That's what that's what Jesus said about the uh, uh, the Pharisees. He says you you bring these other people and then you make them uh, uh, tenfold more worse demon devils than you are. Go ahead, uh, Hayward. I saw your hand. Yeah, um, I see here that you know I see God giving His gifts, and we know that gifts are without repentance. So. When people get God's gift and using it, 
they don't think nothing is wrong because they don't see their gift stopping. You know, because God, once he gives it to you, he's not going to take it back. Right. You know, he tells you what to do with it and do it right. But that's what we see today. People have God's gift for preaching, uh, prophesying, and they're using these gifts and they're not using them right. And the end of it is going to be terrible for the person that has that gift. That's absolutely right. That's absolutely right. If you have a gift and you don't repent, you are not saved. So if you got a gift and you got a calling and, and no repentance, then you have just have a gift and a calling. But you don't know God as your Savior. So we need the repentance. You need to recognize yourself as a, as a sinner. And then when you recognize yourself truly as a sinner, you recognize that no matter how well I think, my ways are not God, but God's ways. So daily, hourly, step by step, we got to ask God, show me. And we got to make the adjustments because we, God will say, okay, I want you to go to the right. And we start going to the right. We pack our bags, man. We move to the right. Boom, boom, boom. There we go. And all we know is God told me to go to the, the right. But you got to check with God tomorrow. Because <laughs> God may say, okay, stop moving. Don't even go. Don't go right or left. Just stand still. But yet we're still going right because we heard the voice of God say, go to the right. But did you check in today? Because today he may say, stand still. And there's a couple of times when God will say, you know what? I need you to back up. Back up? I'm not going backwards. Man. I'm, I'm, I'm going forward. That's what Samuel told uh, Saul. You're going to go forward. And sometimes you got to go back. And I use the analogy a lot <clears throat> because it makes uh, it's easy to understand. You know, I play golf a lot. And one of the things that, uh, that God uh, showed me this analogy is that if I want the golf ball to go forward very far, I initially got to take the swing and do what? Okay. Go backwards with it first. And then I get the momentum to go forward. And when I recognized that, I was like, wow, God, that's such a great analogy that sometimes people get so hung up on, well, I don't, I don't want to take no steps backwards. Mm. Well, sometimes you do. Sometimes it's, there is some... Uh, okay. Oh, I'm sorry to interrupt, but that's a, a sense of pride. That's the spirit of, of pride. pride. Yes. And pride is of the devil. Mm -hmm. And when we start to encompass, oh, I don't want to go back as the Lord has directed us, we are then stepping in, into the, that... Uh, pride area because we don't want people to sit, see or say or mm. um, make question or judge you but the ultimate thing is to just follow God's leadings that's you right. know that's right you got to follow God's leaders and so it's an important thing that we um, we, we follow that and Saul is giving a lot he's given a lot of uh, gifts a lot of anointing here all right um, and, and look what it says in uh, verse 7. It says, And let it be when these signs are come upon thee. Look at these signs. Signs of God's presence. When these signs shall come upon thee, that thou shalt do as occasion serve thee, for God is with thee. All right? God is on your side. Verse 8. And, and thou shalt go down before me to Gilgal, and before and, and behold, I will come unto thee to offer burnt offerings, to sacrifice sacrifices of peace offerings. Seven days thou shalt tarry till I come unto thee and show thee what thou shalt do. Now, verse 8 is really important. And the reason why it's important is because Samuel is telling Saul, you're going to go do something, and you're going to go before me. But he also told him, when you get there, don't go off telling everybody what I said. He said what? Tarry there. Tarry there for, for, um, uh, for seven days. Eight. Don't go off blabbing and talking and everything. Just wait. And when Samuel said, when I get there, I'm going to offer the burnt offering unto God. I'm going to offer the peace offering up to God. Now, what we're going to see here in verse 8 is there going to be another time when Samuel is going to tell Saul to go somewhere, and Saul's going to get impatient with Samuel because Samuel is tarrying. He's taking a long time. And you know what Saul's going to do? Saul's going to be like, you know what? I'm just going to offer the burnt offering up myself. 
Yeah, that's a big uh-oh. And Samuel, that's when Samuel's going to finally going to see. And God's going to allow Samuel to be like, wow. Wait a minute. God is rejecting you. Now, we don't see that yet. But I'm just throwing that in as a, as a spoiler alert. Let you know that's coming down the road. But when we see this here, it's important to recognize Saul did it here. But he's not going to do it down the road. Did you have a question for me? No. All right. Mm -hmm. All right. And so it's important to see that. Look at verse 9. And it was so that when he had turned uh, his back to go uh, from Samuel, God gave him another heart. Mm -hmm. Look at that. God, God has transformed this man. He's given him everything he could want. I'm even going to help you to see and understand what it feels like to have a heart given to you by God. Like I said, he's given him, your debt is paid. All you got to do is what? Apply it. But what are you going to do with this grace? What are you going to do with this mercy? What are you going to do with this forgiveness? What are you going to do with this long suffering? I'm going to use it for my own thing. I'm not going to pay off no debt. I don't believe I'm a sinner. I don't think I need to pay any sin debt. A lot of people have that mindset. Instead of taking the grace of God and being thankful for my, my sins being forgiven and begin to worship God, let me see how I can just take this and do what I want to do. I'm going to go do my thing. What's in my heart? What's in my mind to want to do? Rather than just taking the moment to thank God. All right? But right now, like I said, Saul looks good. Saul is following the right patterns here. Everything is happening. But God knows what's going to happen. God is not confused. He's not, uh, he's, he's not uh, uh, in a situation where he's like, I hope Saul makes it. No, he knows what's going to happen. As much as he gives Saul, it's not going to happen. You know, I, I don't care, you know, how much uh, uh, straightening up and, and, and niceties you do in the pig pen, you know, and have all the mud just in one split place and the flowers <clears> and the grass. <throat> when the pig gets in the pig pen, what's going to happen? Everything's going to be muddy. Because that's what pigs do. Right? And, and they got to have a change. Well, Saul has been given a change, but will he continue in that change? Well, let's keep reading. And we will get that answer, not in this chapter, not in the next couple, several chapters, but we'll get that answer down the road in this book of 1 Samuel. We'll see it happen. We'll point it out when we get there. All right. And so he given him another heart, and it says, and all those signs came to pass that day. Saul is seeing the miraculous of God. Boy, I'm talking about the anointing. That's something right there, right? <clears throat> Verse 10. And when they came thither, to the hill, behold, a company of prophets met him, just like Samuel said. And the Spirit of God came upon him, and he prophesied among them. Saul is now prophesying. Why? Because he has this new heart. But is it really applied? Or is it just being used? Is it a gift without repentance? Gifts and callings all without repentance. And we, we, we never know. So to us, when people are doing this kind of stuff, to us, they look genuine. They look good. That, so that's why we don't know. Only God knows. When, you know, you, you, you sit here, you listen to me, you don't know, okay, Wayne, Wayne sounds like he's, you know, he's really, you know, in, in the things of God. But only God knows my heart completely. When we watch these people on TV, and then, oh, this is a good teacher, this is a good uh, preacher on TV, you know, you go to a church, you listen, you, you know, I have a friend, me and, me and uh, uh, Miss Penny have a friend, and they, they moved down south somewhere, further south, and um, they joined this church, and they were talking about how this church was so good, and the people were doing so well, and everything, and it was just, and for year after year after year, I'm talking about six, seven, eight, maybe, you know, nine, ten years, they just keep talking about how the church is just doing so well. Well, when we met with them earlier this year, they came up, and we're, we're talking with them. They said, we got something to tell you. We found out that the pastor that was of that church, he's sneaking around with a, a lot of other women now, and come to find out that he's with this other woman, and um, he was given the opportunity to repent and to, re, you know, to, to, 
turn away and, and go back to his wife. And he said to the congregation, I'm not going to do it. I'm staying with this woman. Now, all that time, he was doing so well. The church was growing. They brought a new building. They did all this stuff. And you look at that and you go, man, boy, God's anointing is on. But God knew, though my, our, our friend did not know. They were talking about how wonderful this person was. Had no idea that this person had this in their, uh, 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 in their heart to do. And then did it. And then when they were confronted to say, come back to God, repent of your wrong and come back to God. They said, nope, I'm not doing it. I'm staying and I'm going to do what I want to do. Now, how does that happen? And I can guarantee you, it fools us. It makes us look, wow, I really thought this person was the real deal. But God is never fooled. God knows the difference. He knows the difference between a, a true heart heart and a person that is playing the part God knows All right? and so, so Saul prophesies and I'm telling you people are scratching their heads they're like my goodness Saul and we'll, we'll point that out in a minute how some people kind of know Saul they're like, I know Saul now wait a minute what's going on here uh, and sometimes people, you know, can get a feeling about. Yeah, God gives us a little discernment. A little discernment, discernment exactly. To, to tell you to keep your eyes open, look at these flags, look mm -hmm. at that. You right. know, yep. it doesn't match up with the word of God. Not match up with your word, but the word of God. Exactly. You know. And so. we need that discerning spirit. Mm -hmm. We do need. We need that. to pray, but you got to pray for it. You got to pray for it exactly. Mm -hmm. That your eyes are open. All right, verse eleven. And it came to pass when all that knew him before, they knew Saul when? Before. We know. We know Saul. We know him from before. Uh, when they uh, saw that, behold, he prophesied among the prophets. Then the people said one to another, what is this that is come unto the son of Kish? See, they didn't say Saul. They said Kish, the son of Kish. I know the boy when he was born. I watched him grow up. I know, I know his dad. <laughs> what done happened to him? This boy over here prophesying. <laughs> Yo, man. Kish was a good one. Kish was a good warrior. But Saul, I don't know. He's something about this boy. And they, they're questioning it because it seems to be out of place. Now, let me say this. God can take a really bad, wretched individual and save them. So Amen. it's not the fact that the people are questioning it, meaning that God can't do it. God can do it. But they do know who Saul is. That's, that's Kish's boy. I know him. All right. uh, is Saul also among the prophets? They asked the question. They didn't say, oh, Saul's prophesying. They're saying, wait a minute. Saul's among the prophets? They're questioning it with some, with some you know, concern. Reserved. You know, they're kind of reserving judgment about that. Mm -hmm. Let's keep reading. Verse 12. And one of the same people answered and said, But who is their father? Therefore, uh, uh, it became a proverb. Is Saul also among the prophets? So it became like a, a saying. Well, I'm going to be going to do this because I think I'm going to become, you know, this kind of thing. Oh, yeah. Like Saul's one of the prophets. So it was kind of like a saying of like, mm -hmm. a, a, it was a proverb to say, yeah, you might do it. Yeah, if pigs fly, so to speak. Mm -hmm. It's like that. Yeah, I'm going to go do this. Yeah, you might if Saul becomes a prophet. It became that kind of a proverb because there were certain people that kind of had a, 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 enough understanding, either through their understanding of God or like Miss Penny said, through discernment. They were like, yeah, he's prophesying, but... Is Saul a prophet? Really? You know, they're still kind of holding that, that, that judgment on. Let's keep going. Verse 13. And when he had made an end of prophesying, he came to the high place. Okay, so now he's going, he's doing exactly what Samuel told him to do. Verse 14. And Saul, Saul's uncle said unto him, uh, uh, said unto him and to his servants, Whither went ye? And he said to seek the asses. Remember, that was initially what happened. Kish sent Saul out and his servant to go find the donkeys that were lost. And that's how they ended up meeting Samuel. All right. And when uh, we saw that they were 
uh, nowhere, we came to Samuel. Verse 15, and Saul's uncle said, tell me, I pray thee, what Samuel said unto you. Now, Saul's uncle wants to know, what did Samuel say unto you? Tell me what he said. Now, for some reason, Saul's not going to tell him everything. Right? And, and we don't get no indication as to what kind of person Saul's uncle is. We were told his father, Kish, was a great man, a great warrior. Right? But we don't know who his uncle is. But the uncle is kind of like, well, what's going on, nephew? <laughs> what's, hap what's happening? All right. And so look at verse 16. And Saul said unto his uncle, he told us plainly that the asses were found, but that the uh, matter of the kingdom, uh, whereof Samuel spake, he told him not. So he told him that we, that we found the donkeys because Samuel told us. No, no, let me rephrase that. We, we, uh, we were told that the donkeys were found, but they didn't find the donkeys. The, 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 the father and his, and his people found the donkeys. But Samuel told Saul the donkeys have been found. And that's what he told the uncle. But he didn't tell the uncle what Samuel told him about God anointing him king. He's, he's, he's not doing it, which is good. This is what he was supposed to do. Don't go out saying and starting anything and, until what? Tarry seven days. That's what Samuel said, until I get there. Okay. So verse 17. And Samuel called the people together unto the Lord at Mizpah. So now Samuel's there. He's calling all the people together. Meet me at Mizpah. Verse 18. And said unto the children of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel. I like the way Samuel says that. This is the Lord God of Israel. That means he's what? Your leader. That means why do you need a king? Why? But he said, he said, thus saith the Lord God of Israel. I brought up Israel out of Egypt. I brought you out of sin and delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of all kingdoms. Everything that you came into, I brought you out of. And of them that oppressed you in the oppression. Who's the oppressor of the, uh, of the, the, uh, the saints today? Satan. God brings us out of all the oppression. Okay? Verse 19. And you have this day rejected your God. Because you want a king. You don't want God to be Lord. You don't want God to be the God of, of Israel. You want a king. Why do you want a king? Because I want to be like all the cultures around me. I want to be like everybody else. Right. Uh, you have rejected you, you have uh, let me read it again and ye have this day rejected your God who himself saved you out of all your adversaries and your tribulations and ye have said unto him nay but set a king over us now therefore Present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes and by your thousands. So Samuel is saying, okay, God's going to give you what you want. And some people get very happy with that. Ooh, God's going to answer my prayer. I, I kind of want God to tell me plainly that something that I'm praying for it's not it. is not it. Lord, just give me a plain, like, no, Wayne, this is not my will. I want that. We and so have to ask God for that. You're ready to go, Miss Penny. She, she's right there. Miss Penny's right there. You got to ask God for that. So, what did Jesus say? He said in the model prayer. Uh, he, he said, "Not my will, but Thy will be done." Mm -hmm. All right. And so, give us this day our daily bread. All right. And 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 you know, forgive us our debts as we forgive us. And let Your will be done where on earth as it as is it in heaven. Is that's what we got to want. I want your will, Lord, to be done on earth. And I'm on earth. So definitely in me. Let your will be done in me. And that's, that's one of the instructions that Jesus told us that we should pray about. God's will to be done. 
oftentimes we want our will to be done because we get an idea of what we, and, it, and it looks good and we go talk to one or two other people oh that sounds wonderful but it's still not God's will and oftentimes God will say, all right, you know what? I'm, there was no door here. That was not part of the plan. But you know what God does? He will create a door and let you walk through it. Oftentimes what's going to happen is that door will lead to nowhere and you've got to come back out of it anyway. Or the door goes through so many mazes that you end up coming back and you're like, you know, wasting time. And then you finally get back to exactly where you were. And there's a lot of, a lot of things that, that we can do that is just outside of what God would want us to do. And let me tell you, I know I'm guilty of that. And I think we all can raise our hand and say, yep, I've, I've been in that boat too, where you know, we're, we're chasing after things that, that really is not the will of God. And then we got to come back and let's do it the right way. Let's find out what God really wants. Because sometimes you can see things and you be like, ooh, this is what God, I want this, I want this. I, I could tell you story after story of how I just thought this was definitely going to be for me. And then the doors opened up and I was ready to go. And I was like, my spirit, like, this is not for you. And this is not your, this is not the way you, all other people can go that direction. A lot of people can, have done it and they do it. And they're successful and in God's will when they do it. But it wasn't for you. And I think about that oftentimes because um, I had, uh, missionary Scott one time prophesied. She was prophesying on a lot of people. And she prophesied on me and she said, and she was telling all these people how they're going to have these, these these great ministries and these wonderful churches and all these other things. And so I'm like, oh, I'm going to get in line. I'm going to find out which, which one I'm going to have. And she came up to me and said, God's not going to use you that way. He's gonna, You're going to have an unusual ministry. Now, I didn't like that. I didn't want unusual. <laughs> I wanted to be, I wanted the one that was going to be just like how everybody else. They got their churches or whatever the case is, you know, whatever, whatever the, 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 the 35,000 numbers, huh? Yeah, <laughs> one of those real big, you know, uh, scenarios that you see. And she said, no, God's going to use you unusually. That means that it's unique. Not a lot of people are doing what I do. Now, I didn't like it then, and I look at it now, and I realize this is where my heart is anyway. Because I got so disillusioned with some of the aspects of the of how the you know the, the contemporary church is and how it got and, and that's a whole other long story. But the point I'm making is is that God has it for you, and it's going to be unique, and it's going to be for you, and you don't need to chase after anybody. And you can you ooh, somebody else is doing something else, and you look at it. Oh, that's nice. And God bless them, help them, strengthen them to con to continue to do that. Oh, I, 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 I'm happy that they're doing that. But um, it's not what God has called me to do. So trying to find that and stay in that on a continuous basis, a lot of times you don't know the whole plan. And that's the thing about with God. That's why you got to walk with God, what? By faith. Because we want God to show me the whole plan. And God, a lot of times, is not going to show you the whole plan. He's going to show you one or two steps at a time. He won't mess it up. And then therefore you some get... People, <laughs> some people, you show them the whole plan, they'll say, oh no, I don't want that. I don't want that. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yep. That's exactly a lot of times what happens. And then they, they, the they, they just quit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, I'm not going to feed no homeless. I'm not doing that stuff. I'm on a church. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep. A lot of times we do that. All right. So now... Um, See, where was I at here? 19? Let me just read 19 again. And ye shall this day reject, you have this day rejected God, whom himself saved thee out of your adversaries and your tribulations. And ye have said unto him, Nay, set a king over us. Now, therefore, present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes, and by your thousands. Verse 20. And Samuel uh, had caused all the tribes of Israel <clears throat> to come near. And the tribe of Benjamin was taken. All right, we know that that's where the tribe that Saul comes from. Verse 21. And when he had uh, caused the tribe of Benjamin to come near by their families, the family of uh, Matri was taken. And Saul 
the son of Kish was taken. And when they sought him, they could he could not be found. So now, here's Samuel using the discernment of God to pick the tribe and the family and then eventually Saul, who Samuel already knew. Um, all of a sudden, where is Saul? He's, he's there to be anointed king and all of a sudden, what? He's out of place. Now, this is going to be a common theme for Saul. It seems insignificant here. It seems like, well, he's, you know, he's out of place. He's not, uh, we, we can't seem to find him. Well, well, well where is he? Let's, let's, let's read this and then we'll talk more about that point of, about being out of place. Uh, verse 22. Therefore, they inquired of the Lord further. They went to God. Where is this man Saul? If the man should uh, yet come thither. And the Lord answered, Behold, he hath hid himself among the stuff. Where did Saul go? He went, and the stuff, if you read other Bible translations, that word stuff is translated into baggage. And I thought that was very uh, uh, kind of comical in a sense. Saul is being called king, but he's around, he's carrying a whole lot of what? Baggage. <clears throat> he's got a lot of stuff with him. Saul is, he's the king, but he's, uh, he's, uh, he's amongst all kinds of other stuff. Instead of being stood up, standing up as king, initially, he goes and, pres and, and puts himself in the midst of other stuff, in the midst of other baggage. All right, verse 23. Now, this is where all of a sudden now he stands up. Uh, some people say, well, he's hiding because he's afraid or he's humble. Um, I, I, I don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us his emotions about that. Uh, people kind of put that into it, and it could be. Uh, remember, he started off okay. Maybe he is starting off hu with humility. Maybe he is. Um, but you know, it, 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 it's not something that is genuine and long-lasting, whatever it may have been as to why he was hiding. 23. And they ran and fetched uh, him thence, and when he stood among the people, he was higher than any of the people for he his head and uh, for his head and upwards so he was taller than everybody else he was the tallest person there and that is something that was part of what the Israelites wanted they wanted a king that would go before them that would be representative of what they thought they were we're big strong powerful people so we want our king to be a big strong powerful person but yeah, he's big, strong, and powerful. What is he doing? He's hiding. <clears throat> See, you need the courage of God. And we're going to find out later on that's going to be part of the nature of Saul as well. Saul does not have courage. He doesn't have the ability to do the things. Saul does not have the, the, the heart of a lion. Jesus is called the, 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 the lion of the tribe of Judah. Judah. <clears throat> Courage. There's something about a lion. A lion is not the fastest animal. That that you know, you got the cheetah and you got the condor bird. You know, they they go way faster than a lion. They that they're, they're not the, uh, the 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 biggest or the strongest. You got elephants and and rhinoceroses and hippos. And, you know, you got all these. But a lion is not afraid of any of them. A lion can take down an elephant. You get a pride of lions. It ain't easy, and they, sometimes they're not successful, but they have the courage to do it. And that's another thing, you know, you know when God calls us to do things, uh, courage is going to be needed. Because a lot of times you're going to be fighting things that are what? Bigger than you. Faster than you. It shows that, uh, to me, it just shows that Saul, from the be beginning, wasn't really trusting in God. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's why he cow down and, and he was hiding good point good and point. he didn't have and he didn't show forth courage because mm -hmm. he was in his own self in his own self exactly. and, and he knew he he was insufficient yep so that's right that's, that's right he's finishing it right there you know he, he's trusting in his own abilities already here and so he's hiding when god has called you something called you to do something and you know it's god you don't gotta hide it now there's times when god will tell you and show you things but he will tell you don't hide it, but just don't say anything. Mm -hmm. Be quiet. Mm -hmm. Don't show it off yet. Let God work it out. 
right, 24. And Samuel said unto all the people, See ye him whom the Lord hath chosen. You wanted a king? This is who God's going to give you. And God is giving you exactly what you want. A big old strong tall king that looks good. Saul, remember, Saul was a handsome person. He looked good. All those things, right? So uh, Samuel said unto all the people, See ye him whom the Lord hath chosen, that there is none like him among all the people. And all the people shouted. There they go shouting again. So we've been seeing, how many times have we seen the people? Ooh, they just start to shout. <laughs> we see that a lot. You go to church, boy, folks be shouting because of certain things. And, they, and they're, they're shouting not knowing this is not going to last. This is a problem. It looks like it's going well. But it's a problem. And you'll see it eventually. And the people shouted and said, God saved the king. Wow. You want to know where that saying comes from, right? God saved the king. Here it is right here in the Bible. They're not saying God bless us. God keep us. Now they're praying for God to bless the king. Because they believe if God blesses the king, then the king will bless us. But why, don't, why, why do you want this intermediate person? Why do you want to put somebody in between you and God? That's one of the things that's a problem when people, you know, they, they become, you know, leaders and pastors and bishops. And they say, well, you don't pray to God. You come ask me and I'll go to God on your behalf. You need to, you need to leave that. Go, you know, you hear that. You're like, okay, that's, that's a sign. Because you're going to put yourself in between me and the Lord. When Jesus died on the cross, there was a, there was a veil in the place that separated the holy place and the holy of holies. You know what happened to that veil? That veil was ripped. That means that you can now come to God yourself. How? Boldly. Come to him directly. Amen. And that's what, that's what people should be preaching and telling folks. You need to go to God for yourself. Build your own relationship with God. Make sure you're talking to God. Don't have somebody... Wait, that reminds me, like, a lot of the older people in my family used to tell me, be careful who's praying on, for you or touching you or that's praying right. for you in it. I'm always hesitant mm -hmm. about that. You know, one time I was sitting at the river on the bench that was dedicated to my aunt. She passed away. And this lady walked up to me and said, I want to pray for you. And I looked at her like she was crazy because mm -hmm. I just, I'm very hesitant when people touching me and praying. I just, I don't know what it is. I, I think because it's just instilled in me. Be careful who's praying for you and coming over to you that way. But, you know, I just try to trust God and and hopefully nobody's trying to, you know, mm -hmm. do the wrong thing. Yeah, that, yeah. Is, that is so true. You do have to have that discerning spirit mm -hmm. when people come uh, at, to you uh, as though they are an angel of light. Right. Amen. Know? And um, uh, there's a lot of wolves in sheep's clothing. Mm -hmm. And you got to be very, very it's, careful. Isn't there uh, a scripture that says, touch no man suddenly? Yep, yeah, that's right. So, that lay hands on no, no man, man suddenly. suddenly. Exactly. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. So yeah. Yeah. So you do need to be prayerful about that. That is a good thing to do. All right. Um, verse 25. We're almost done. Then Samuel told the people the manner of the kingdom and wrote it in a book and laid it up uh, before the Lord. And Samuel uh, sent the people away every man to his house. So he says, now I'm going to write to, in here the manner of what's going to happen. And that may be why we have this book here called First Samuel, Second Samuel. Um, it doesn't say specifically that he wrote that. That's the book he was writing. It may have been another book. But whatever it was, he wrote it down. And you know why he wrote it down? So that when people said, well, you, know, you didn't, you didn't uh, tell us that. No, I told you right here that God had was upset with you because you rejected him from being God. I told you that, and because you wanted a king. Just because I did it doesn't mean God's anointing was totally in it. God is appeasing you and allowing you to have your... God makes us with the uh, ability to have free will, to have mm -hmm. choice, mm -hmm. which is an enormous thing. We don't understand how valuable that is to make a choice. So therefore, I choose each day, every day, 
I choose God. And you got to make sure you choose God each day. Speak to God each day. Ask God, is, am I still steering and driving and moving in the right direction each day? Because uh, there may be times when God will say, okay, you are going in the right direction, but slow down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You may be going in the right direction, but pause and stop. That happened with, with uh, Moses. They were going in the right direction, but they had to stop. Why? Because there was a big old stop sign. You know what that stop sign was? The Red Sea. <laughs> that was the stop sign. So there was no way they could miss that. Well, we got to stop here. But then what happened? God opened up a way out of nowhere. And the problem is that if we had to go certain ways, we are not going to go the way where we know, oh, this a, if I go this way, there's going to be a major problem because we're never going to be able to get across the Red Sea. So we got to find a different way to go. Well, then you're not walking by faith. You're walking by your own understanding. You, you're doing your own calculations. You're doing your own scientific you know, philosophy on what to do instead of saying, God says go this way. Well, he must not have said go this way because this, there's nothing but a river there. Nothing but a, not a river, nothing but a sea there. So that can't be what God said. And so we calculate out the word of God with our own uh, mathematics, scientific philosophy when God is saying, I need you to go that way, you won't see it. There is a way. But you got to go by what? By faith. God had a big old door, a big old opening in the, in the Red Sea that they could not see until they got there and waited for God. And they got there and they had to do what? They had to tarry. They had to wait there for a while. We're just sitting here. Now the Egyptians are catching up to us. Right? And so it's an important thing that we, we, we understand this. And so the people are not doing this. They want to be like the other folks around them. They don't want to trust God for themselves. They don't want God to be their Lord and their King and their, and their Savior. They want a King. All right, so Samuel sends them all home. He wrote it all down just to remind them in case y'all ever have a question. I got the record of it right here. I got the receipt of your purchase. All right, 26. And Saul also went home to, to Gibeah. And there went uh, with him a band of men whose heart God had touched. So God had touched the heart of some people. Follow Saul. Go with him. He had already had a band of, of followers. Why? Because God made him a leader. And when God makes you a leader, guess what you're going to have? Followers. Oh. People are going to put it God's going to put in the people's heart do what, follow this person go, go along with them and you'll have some people there alright, uh, how, many, how many followers did Jesus have he had 12 in the beginning how many does he got now can't even number you can't, you can't, even, can't even number so the start is not what counts it's the, it's the end result always try to remember that 27. But the children of, of Belial said, How shall this man save us? Now, there's all, there's, there's questionings. There's, there's, um, there's still not a sense of like, oh, this is really it. There's still this question. Uh, and they despised him and brought him no presents, but he held his peace. So Samuel, I'm sorry, Saul already got what? The devil fighting against him. Why? Because the devil, all the devil knows right now is uh, God has anointed this man king. Let me see how I can get to him. No matter what gift and calling you have, when your gift and calling begins to operate, guess who is triggered and automatically comes to try to distort your gift? Mm -hmm. The devil. The minute Jesus got baptized, guess who showed up? Satan. Any blessing or any gift that you have, you're going to have the enemy. The key is, if it is of God, all you got to do is not quit. The Bible says, a good man falls down seven, but he does what? He rises. So you can make mistakes. You can, you, can, you can fail. I'm trying to do something that God has called me to do, but I'm failing. What, what do you do? You get up. All right. And the scripture also says that, uh, that we shall uh, reap if we what? 
Faint not. Faint not. Faint not. What does faint not mean? Don't quit. Don't stop. Oftentimes we're like, I, I can't take this anymore. I'm done. I'm, I'm finished. And that's human nature. That's all that is. It's not just, you know. And the devil will try to capitalize on that human nature. And say, and, and pat you on the back. Yeah, that's right. You should, yep, yep, yep. I wouldn't do it either. Yep, I, yep, just don't waste no, no more of your time. Don't waste no more of your effort. Don't waste no more of your money. Don't, don't just, just quit. And God has not called us to quit. He called, he called us to go forward in courage and in faith. And that's something that we got to learn to do. And now, God, go ahead. And God has wants us to glorify Him in our weakness. He mm. knows we're going to get get weak, and that. But in in our weakness, He is strong. Mm. So when we get to a point where we feel like we want to quit, rest in God, quit in Him, and it's not quit in and and throwing up hands and want to you know walk away. That's when we when we throw up hands. That's when we let the devil the devil and all his imps um, come wreck us. But I feel like because we all are human, you know. The job that God has got us to do is 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 a mighty job. Mm-hmm. So we are going to get weak and well doing. But it, you know, as long as we don't faint, right. you know, we have to continue with God and say, Lord, and be be honest, Lord. I, I I'm you know I'm not I'm not feeling strong. I'm not sure. I'm mm-hmm. not and lay and ask Him to guide us and to protect us and to cover us, so that you know. And that's when we tarry for God. Mm-hmm. And then that, that's where God is glorified because then he can show up. Right. Glory to God. Amen. Then he can show up yeah. and show out for, and on our behalf. That's right. That's right. And that's an important thing. And I like the, the one phrase that Miss Penny said. I'm going to close with this. She said that a lot of times when we get into that situation, we hide where? In God. Mm-hmm. And when she said that, you know what I thought about? Right, what we just read? Where did Saul hide? He hid in, 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 the, in the stuff it's amongst the baggage. Mm-hmm. So people are hiding and waiting in the wrong place. If you're, if you're overwhelmed, and Saul was overwhelmed, he didn't hide in God. He, he hid in the stuff. And so a lot of times when we're going through and we're, we're, we're dealing with stuff, I, let me get into God. Mm-hmm. And so somebody says, okay, Wayne, that's great. I like the way you said that. But what exactly does hide in God mean? That means sometimes you, you got to get by yourself. You withdraw a little bit. But you're not withdrawing in depression or in worry, you're withdrawing in prayer, mm-hmm. fasting, and reading the word of God, God. Mm-hmm. praying, you seeking God. That's how you hide in God. Right? And so you get your word of God, you get your Bible, you pray, you meditate, you focus on the things of God. You're maybe not taking a whole lot of phone calls, watching a lot of TV, mm-hmm. you're not eating all kinds of pizza and burgers and french fries. you 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 just in God, mm-hmm. seeking God. Because you are overwhelmed with something and then you hide in God but I'm not going to hide in the stuff of this world I'm not going to hide in the baggage like Saul did and so that's a good point I, I, that popped in my mind when, when uh, Miss Penny made that statement alright any other comments or questions about what we talked about here in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 10 alright if not we're going to close we thank God for 